Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to invite you to this Brain Hub lecture. This is the annual Victor Beard lecture. Um, I'd like to start off just by saying a few words about Brain Hub. Um, uh, Brain Hub is a, a, a campus wide initiative to bring together um, faculty and researchers who are working on brain science related questions. And it's really um, uh, in, the, in the, this, inspired by the interdisciplinarity of research across CMU, it brings together people from departments that you might not even imagine would have anything to do with brain science, from um, computer science, from statistics, psychology, biology, engineering, um, and even uh, the School of Fine Arts. Um, so we're really delighted to be able to uh, provide some resources and also bring together our communities for events like this. Um, I want to make a special plug for those of you who are um, computer scientists or neuroscientists to think about um, participating in the Neuro Hackathon. This is a Brain Hub um, supported event that has actually had great participation from all CMU's campuses. Last year we had students both from Qatar um, and also Rwanda who were participating. Um, we had uh, about 50 students last year, uh, about 10 teams. Um, uh, and, and the object is to do real sort of investigative discovery-based science on neuroscience, brain science-related data sets using modern methods of statistical and machine learning analysis. So I encourage you to think about attending. It'll be Monday and Tuesday after graduation, and we'll have travel awards and other fun stuff to distribute. Let's see. So maybe that's it. There we go, okay. Um, and lastly, I wanna make um, just a comment about the um, uh, supporter of this lecture, this particular lecture, Victor Berg, graduated from the Mellon College of Science in fit, with a degree in physics in 1964, and he's endowed a lecture series. This is the, I think, third annual lecture that we've had um, that uh, we really have some leeway to invite people who um, are really doing exciting work that crosses disciplinary boundaries. Um, Victor has been here for some of the previous lectures. He extends his apologies for not being able to attend today, uh, but we're very grateful for his assistance. And I'd like to give him a round of applause and absentia for his support. All right, so it's my pleasure today to introduce Tim Lillicrap, who comes to us from Google DeepMind. Um, I first crossed paths with Tim at a cosine workshop on deep learning and neuroscience, and I thought, wow, this is really the perfect intersection of contemporary computer science and neuroscience, and it would be really a, a great way to bring together members of our community to think about how we can use the brain to inspire um, artificial intelligence and learning algorithms. Uh, Tim got his PhD in systems neuroscience, so he's really a card-carrying neuroscientist uh, with Stephen um, Scott at Queen's University in Ontario. Um, he's both Canadian and British. Uh, he was a postdoc with Colin Ackerman at the University of Ox Oxford, and he moved from his graduate work studying um, motion control, postural control, and movement uh, to thinking about um, the computational strategies for deep learning that are based really quite rigorously on neural architectures. Um, from dendritic anatomy, how dendritic anatomy supports um, feedback or um, uh, signal uh, comparisons, um, to thinking about synaptic weights and the distributions of, of synaptic or connection weights um, in synthetic as well as biological networks. Uh, Tim's been at Google DeepMind since 2014, where he's uh, and now a staff research scientist. He's also an adjunct professor at University of College London and um, is quite involved in um, uh, reviewing Google um, faculty research awards in computational neuroscience. And I think has great exposure, can bring a, a really great um, perspective on what's, what are the exciting things that are going on in this field today. So I'd like to welcome Tim. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, uh, so I'm, I, I'm Tim, and I'm going to present uh, a bunch of things today which are sort of um, back and forth between neuroscience and machine learning. And there's been tons of people who helped out um, with various of these things. Um, sometimes that's listed at, uh, at the bottom, sometimes at the, at, it, otherwise it's at the end. Um, at, yeah, there's tons of people who've been behind some of the work I've, I'll, I'll talk about today. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about some deep, something about deep learning, backprop, and the brain. And I'm going to, I'm going to sort of, kind of, I am, as I said, going to try and go both ways. I'm going to talk about some interplay between some of the stuff that's been going on in deep learning and neuroscience. I'm going to talk about uh, how can recent results in deep learning and reinforcement learning inform neuroscience research, which I think is kind of the easier direction. Um, and I'm also going to talk about does neuroscience have anything to say about machine learning now, which I think is, is harder and may become increasingly harder, but I think it's still saying something. And I'm going to talk about a piece of work which kind of goes in that direction, at least in the sense that we were inspired by neuroscience ideas and going through old neuroscience papers helped us try some things which at least nominally are working, uh, working well. So <clears throat> I'm going to start here because it's kind of what I'm, I, I, I kind of where I began as a PhD and, and what, uh, what I think about most of the time, which, which is this whole um, environment uh, agent uh, loop um, where you've, you know, you've got some environment you want to act in um, and some, some agent which may be made up of a bunch of networks. Um, you take actions on that environment and you see observations. Um, and, and, and you get some reward for the things that you're, you're doing. And to me, this is sort of a bit of an encapsulation of uh, everything that we think about, right? So grounding it out in tasks. Um, some people, I think Daniel Wolpert, off, Wolpert often says, look, if you're not acting, um, you're not, you, you, you know, evolution can really only act on actions, um, not what you think. So ultimately, for me, it, it's nice to think about tasks um, and, and, and really approach things that way. Um, so, I still think of myself, even though about 90% of what I do is machine learning nowadays, reinforcement learning, I still think of myself as participating a bit in, deep, in, in neuroscience, um, and the reason for it is this, um, and that is that if you don't even have a single formal model that can solve a given problem, then it's really difficult to understand how the brain might be doing it. So if you don't have an existence proof, a formal algorithm you can write down, then you know, going and unpicking what the brain is doing is, I think, a tough job. So, the sort of, there's been a bunch of development in, in deep reinforcement learning that's giving us algorithms and architectures and approaches to solve previously intractable problems. And we shouldn't mistake these for models of human or animal behavior. Um, but they're a good starting place, and as soon as we have a single one that works for a given behavior, um, then it makes it much easier to instantiate variants that might tell us something about human and animal behavior um, at cognition. So I think that's the sense in which I would say I'm still, to the extent that I'm, I'm, I'm doing something like that, still participating a bit in the neuroscience project. As I said, I'm a little more skeptical about the other direction, uh, really, really increasingly. Um, some of the engineering uh, in machine learning and reinforcement learning really, I think, is running ahead of what, what is there in the neuroscience literature. But there's still some um, and th that I think we can, we can kind of take inspiration from. Um, I will talk about a, a, couple things, uh, a couple things today. One of them um, that I'll kind of try and flag along the way as I go um, is this question of whether uh, backpropagation or an algorithm like it um, might be running in the brain. Um, and this is, this is really back to this credit assignment problem. Um, and the credit assignment problem is just this. You know, if I have some motor output um, and there were neurons earlier in a chain which contributed to that motor output, um, then how can I adjust these weights uh, earlier in the chain um, to, to make that, that motor output more appropriate to do what I, to do what I want? Um, and there's sort of a long history of this where uh, when backpropagation uh, sort of emerged on the scene, um, people thought maybe this has something to do with the brain. And that was sort of fairly quickly discarded, certainly by the mid-90s, as, as a bit silly. Um, but now it's coming back as a, as a question. Um, and so I'll just, I'll just sort of say this for a moment. <clears throat> so I think everyone in this room probably knows uh, backprop is really the, the um, credit assignment algorithm that we use in practice for pretty much all of the state of the art, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning algorithms. So it shows up basically in, in all of these places now. Um, and so there's, uh, and, and, and it is essentially this, right, that you change your weights um, in some direction uh, in, in the negative of the uh, derivative of the error with respect to those weights, those parameters in your network. So that's, that's what it is. Um, of course, there's lots of sort of variations on this, but that's the, the, the sort of essence. And it's used everywhere from ImageNet, solving things like ImageNet, to solving uh, games like Go. Um, I think there's good reason to believe that this kind of credit assignment, which is based on rich feedback from uh, later layers, 
to earlier layers is really important for doing, uh, for, for solving hard problems in deep networks, which is, which is roughly what the, the brain is. So, <clears throat> um, I said I'm, I'm going to kind of talk about this tangentially as I go. I want to flesh this out a little bit more. Um, I often kind of think about, uh, think about this, that there's some sort of, there's, there's a sort of spectrum of algorithms um, which are more or less precise about how they want to change, um, change synapses in a network based on uh, errors or outputs that they, they make. Um, so on the, on the left-hand side, you have very simple algorithms um, like activity perturbation, weight perturbation, which would do something like correlate noise in the neurons with changes in performance, changes in downstream performance, and then broadcast that, that idea, that, that sort of um, performance metric, something like a dopamine signal across the network, um, and use those correlations to make weight updates. And I think a lot, of, a lot of neuroscience has sort of thought, you know, this is maybe one of the main ways that learning is going on in the brain. There's a real problem with this, though, and a reason that this is not used in practice in most of the large-scale machine learning things that we do, and that is that the variance on the gradient estimates that you get out of this kind of approach are just horrific, right? So trying to do this for uh, ImageNet is probably, uh, at the very least, a silly thing to do, um, may just not work at all. Um, so, so on the other end, you have things like backprop, which say, I'm really going to assign to each synapse uh, a specific amount of credit. Like, you should change by this much uh, in this direction. Um, and that, that's really important. Now, I think in practice, there's lots of good reasons to believe uh, that the backprop is not, uh, <clears throat> is not implemented naively or exactly in the brain. But there's probably, there is, I think, a big spectrum of things in between these. And we should be looking for algorithms when we want to explain how Cortex is learning. We should be looking for algorithms uh, here, ones which can actually train deep networks effectively on hard problems. Anyway, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be talking about that a bit as I go. I'm gonna be uh, talking more about deep reinforcement learning and some things that we've done, in it re done with it recently, um, things that the field has done with it, but I'm gonna kind of touch back to this subject of, of um, uh, backprop in the brain as I go. So, okay, uh, I wonder how many people in this room have done reinforcement learning. I'm guessing not that many from who, uh, people I spoke to, so I'm gonna do a quick rundown of this stuff. Um, so this is, here we're just gonna formalize that whole like world of the agent living in an environment and so on. And we're gonna, we're gonna so, so a couple uh, pieces here then. This is a policy which, which says, uh, gives a, a probability distribution over actions given a state that it happens to find it in. That state is, say, the observation. Um, the, ac the agent would emit, can emit an action then to the environment. The environment has this uh, transition uh, dynamics which basically says, if I'm in this state and I take this action, then there's some probability distribution over moving into some state st plus one. And then finally, the environment also emits rewards. This is the way we think about it. So this is the way we sort of formalize this stuff. Um, and to be a little more, uh, a little more specific, I might say, okay, here, here's how things look a little more in a, in a deep learning case. I might have a policy which is uh, basically made up of a bunch of layers of neurons. Um, which at the top produce a probability distribution over actions. I would sample an action from that probability distribution and send it to the environment. Um, and then I would get uh, feedback from the environment which would go in as input to the network. And I might do something like this where I summarize all the parameters in the network, uh, all the weight matrices in the network, say, into this uh, variable theta. And we'll just do that for convenience as, as we go along. So. Um, What's, what's sort of happened, uh, I'm gonna give you one particular take uh, way into reinforcement learning, um, and that's this idea of the policy gradient. I think it's the most, the easiest to get your head around in some sense. And so what I'm, what I'm showing here is a, a single trial uh, of sort of moving through an environment where you sort of start in some state, you compute from that state a probability distribution over your actions, you sample an action, you get a reward, you sort of follow your transition dynamics to a new state, you put that into your network, and so on. So this rolls through time, and you get, say, a, a game of Go out of this, or you get a, you know, a, a, a trajectory where someone moves across, uh, something moves uh, motor-wise through the room or something like this. Um, and you can compute the probability of a particular trajectory, uh, tau, like this. So the probability of that trajectory is the probability of starting in this state, 
and then producted uh, this sort of, you know, the transition dynamics and your um, uh, probabilities of taking certain actions. So this tells you then what's the probability of taking a specific trajectory. <clears throat> um, okay. Then what we do in, in, in RL is we'd say, okay, fine. I roll, I've rolled out this trajectory, and I'm going to talk about then a return for this trajectory, which is basically, a, I, I, in, the, in the simplest case, usually a discounted sum of the rewards that I got at each time step as I moved, as I moved through this trajectory. And so then for us, in, 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 in reinforcement learning, what we, would, what we want to think about then is this objective function, uh, ultimately, which is sort of an integral over uh, all the trajectories, um, and sort of saying the probability of that trajectory, given my parameters in my network, um, times the return uh, that I would get uh, associated with that trajectory. And in some sense, I want to maximize this thing. So I want to make this thing as big as possible. Um, and this thing is a function of the parameters of my network. Um, and so what you would most naively do, and that's, this is the policy gradient that I mentioned, um, the, what you would do is say, OK, I've got a function here. I'm going to take the gradient of this thing um, and move down, uh, move down, the, uh, move down the gradient um, with respect to theta. So, and that's the policy gradient. And I'm not going to belabor this, because I think if you're interested, you can dig into it. Um, but, that, but that's the basic idea, is you basically just say, OK, I'm going to take the derivative of this uh, objective function uh, with respect to theta. I play a few math tricks, um, and I can get to this point. And interestingly, or potentially most interestingly, um, if you play a few more math tricks with this thing, um, you'll, you can see that the transition dynamics, which show up here, uh, those transition dynamics actually drop out. And I end up with an expression, I can end up with an expression, which have none of the um, transition dynamics in them. And this is the model-free, this is sort of model-free policy gradient algorithm that a lot of people have used recently. And it's, it's actually reasonably simple as far as things go. I know there's a little bit of math here, but most of it is stuff that you could do in a first-year, second-year calculus course, and not much more than that. Um, and, and with this, you can actually do some quite, quite interesting things. So, okay. Um, let's then just run through what it would look like to do sort of a single round of learning in a, in a policy gradient setting. Um, here's what you do. You would sample a trajectory by doing a specific rollout through uh, space and time. You sample this trajectory. Um, you then compute an estimate uh, of the policy gradient, this thing, um, where your, your, your parameters are set to this uh, theta i. Uh, and then you would take a step in the, the direction of that thing um, and, and update your parameters. Um, and that's it. So this is, this is sort of the vanilla, vanilla reinforced policy gradient, model free. And, and remarkably, you can do, with not much more than this, some pretty amazing stuff. So um, this is a, uh, an environment, uh, an agent, sorry, an agent which has been trained with something not much more than just the policy gradient. Um, and th what it's going to do, it's, it's learned to, from pixels, so this is um, every, uh, every image of a video game coming in is going to be pushed through a continet. Uh, this thing is going to take actions. And its goal is to find these green apples in this little environment. Um, and to begin with, uh, when it would act, it would just randomly bump into walls. So it has no sense of anything. It gets, points, it gets a point when it gets an apple, and otherwise it gets nothing. Um, and over, oh, somehow, this is, there we go. Um, and this, not much more than the policy gradient, is this working? Um, with not much more than the policy gradient, you can get these kinds of reasonably sophisticated behaviors where it will search for these apples in this, uh, in this environment. Um, it will learn to find them, um, home in on them, and, and do a reasonably good job of navigating around. And that all comes out of this model-free sort of uh, model free sort of updating, uh, just as I showed you, with a little bit more. Now, there is a problem with this, which I'm kind of indicating here, and we can, we, we'll, we'll talk more about this, which is that <clears throat> this takes a lot of data. So this works fine if you've got a sort of a fairly horrific amount of data at your disposal to feed into a simulator to do these rollouts and to do these policy gradients. So some of the stuff I'm going to talk about are directions to, to sort of get, get around that, at least in some sense. So I mentioned that there was a little more into this, and uh, a little more that went into this, uh, the algorithm that actually, uh, that I, you know, in, in the agent that I just showed you. And this is the little more. 
So it actually uses um, some value functions, uh, the idea of value functions to uh, do a bit better. Um, and so what happens here? So the value function, this guy, is, is a function which says, given your current policy, pi, um, and given that you're in this particular state S, uh, then how much reward would I expect to accrue by, um, by taking my policy from here on out? So you start at S at T, at state S, um, and then you're gonna act with your policy in the environment from there on out. How much reward would I expect to accrue over that uh, time period? And this is, if you like, uh, in some sense, a kind of a model, but it's a very limited model of the environment. It's, only, it's one which only tells you something about what you're gonna expect specifically reg with regards to the task reward. The Q function, this Q function is very similar. It basically says exactly the same thing, but it says, if I'm in some particular state S, and then I take this action, and from that point out, follow my uh, policy pi, how much reward would I expect to accrue? And then finally, this advantage function is basically the difference between these things. So it's sort of, it, it, it says, what is the, the specific advantage of taking this action over that one? Um, the, the, so, and these functions are used all over the place. This is the other part, uh, I suppose, of model-free learning. And so the algorithm that I actually showed you running, <coughs> it, it does this. It has a network which takes in state, and it computes two things. It computes a distribution over the actions that it could take, and it also computes uh, a value function which says, this is what I think I'm gonna get uh, return-wise by rolling my policy uh, on from here on out. Um, and so in practice, the algorithm looks uh, almost the same as what I showed you earlier. It's basically go through, uh, compute, get a, re a reward, compute a return from the network, compute a value, and then just take a difference between the return that you actually got uh, and, the difference, and the value that you predicted you would get um, and that, that, that gives you an estimate of the advantage. And so that basically says, this is what I think I should have gotten from this state. Um, in fact, I got this when I actually rolled my policy out. Um, and that advantage then gives me a better idea about how to do my updating. So in particular, you end up with uh, two loss functions for this, for this uh, network then. So you end up with one loss function which basically says, you know, take that difference and use it to update uh, V. So basically improve your value function. Improve its ability to estimate how well you're gonna do into the future, uh, reward-wise. And then in the, instead of the policy gradient, which before was just this return, now we're gonna use this uh, advantage estimate calculation here. Um, and, that, and that basically is a, a lower variance estimate on, you know, on, the, on this derivative, on, on, this, uh, on this derivative of the objective function that I really care about. Okay, so I've shown you some machinery. I'm gonna show you very briefly um, some, some other behavior you can do. It's a kind of remarkable what you can do with these things if you have a simulator um, to throw at it. So this is some other behavior that's been learned essentially with just uh, a deep network and policy gradient um, with the value function, some of the value function tricks that I've shown you. Um, so this is, uh, these are um, what, what's happening here. Effectively, the the task reward in all these cases is just to go forward. The network, um, what, what the network has as inputs, basically the joints of these physical bodies, and it has a limited vision, sort of a, kind of a LIDAR-like vision just out in front of it. Um, and, and from that task objective, it learns effectively all this behavior. So it's just sort of go forward as quickly as you can and get, get where you're going. Um, its outputs, I should say, the outputs of the network is sort of a distribution over the, the, joint, uh, the joint angle torques. So how to push on those joint angle torques. And all of these behaviors just emerge from that. You can see this um, same basic thing is, uh, can be employed on other bodies with effectively no change to the algorithm. So you're basically just changing what goes into these networks um, and what comes out of them. Um, but the algorithmic stuff essentially stays the same. You can even get this to run in... Uh, you can even get this to run in uh, humans. So here's, here's one. <coughs> uh, here's a human, uh, a humanoid-like figure that has learned to go forward. So here, here it's, it, it fails. But it, it, it can do these things reasonably well. Um, <laughs> so it learns to do these things reasonably well. And this is all the sort of variation in the environment and so on uh, is all the variation in the environment <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give it a moment. Yeah.
Uh, so importantly, it's never seen these kinds of, it's, it's sort of not seen the particularities of this particular environment as it's going through this, um, which, is, which is what's kind of neat. So here it's another one where it's being perturbed uh, as it goes, and it can handle these things, these kinds of things as well. So, <clears throat> so you can do some remarkable things with uh, just model-free uh, model RL nowadays. Um, and, but I, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, something, a, a, a couple other things here, which are that, you know, there really, some, there really are some things missing from a lot of the, the impressive deep RL work. And, and, you know, part of the answer for people who care is definitely like off-policy learning. That's a massive part of what's missing, I think, from what I just showed you. Um, but there's two other ones that I'm going to kind of focus on. One of them is models of the environment and probably learned in an unsupervised fashion. Um, and that's been hard to do, but we're, I think we're making some progress on it, and I'll talk about some work today that was, again, inspired a bit by neuroscience ideas um, that seems to be working, that, that gives us a, a sort of a fairly big benefit over just running model-free uh, RL as is. Um, and the other one is um, fast updating in memory space rather than parameter space. So that is having large memory storages, maybe a bit like a hippocampus. In fact, sort of the early, the early memory storages that were developed a few years ago were really inspired, like the NTM, the neural Turing machine, were really inspired by people thinking about a hippocampus and what it would mean to have a place where you store large memories at each time step. Um, and so these are the two things that um, I, I'll, I'll talk about in the next little bit. <clears throat> okay, so to situate this, I want to kind of think about uh, a simple task, a task, I, I'm going to talk about tasks like this in general, but a simple task like the, the kid's memory game. So you guys probably all played this as a kid, um, and the idea is that there's some, there's some cards on the floor, and you can turn one over, and you know, once you turn it over, you turn another over. If it's a matching one, you get a point, let's say, uh, and if it doesn't match, you flip them both back. And then you have to remember where these things are as you go. And so the action is basically flip a card, right? And the inputs in this case are also, say, an image. Um, and so in this case, let's just sort of, uh, yeah, so that, that, that's kind of the idea is you flip these over. In this case, there was two, uh, one after the next that were chosen, um, and they were the same. So then you get a point for that. They're removed from the board and get a point. Um, and this seems like a very easy game to play. And, and in fact, we thought if you, would just, you, you just applied uh, policy gradients like what I've shown you, um, you would kind of solve this, this sort of game. And it's, it's surprisingly much harder than you thought. So here would be <coughs> the simplest kind of uh, an agent, if you like, set up to, 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 to uh, train on this kind of environment. Um, one where you get uh, some information from your environment, like an image, potentially some other things, which I'll get into in more complicated tasks. But this is basically an observation. Um, you would encode that observation. Then you have here, uh, let's call this, uh, this a recurrent neural network. For many of you, you might know what an LSTM is, so that's in practice what we, would, we, we started with here. Um, and then you sort of put these things together to produce a policy um, and a policy loss. And so you could train this just as I talked about in the, the standard um, policy gradient way. You can go a little bit further and have uh, something where you've actually hooked this LSTM up to a large external memory where you can write uh, vectors to this on a time step by time step basis. So this is, I think, a little more like what, a, what you're doing um, with a hippocampus. You really are dumping, uh, you're dumping maybe compressed, but you're dumping much richer memories to, uh, much richer memories of what you're encountering to uh, some store where you can later search for it. So um, there are memories now where you can, you can have uh, controllers that output keys which you basically search over that memory with, and then those, those searches return red vectors to your uh, controller network. Right. So this is um, maybe, it's, it may not be apparent, but this is reasonably standard nowadays to think about dreaming, to think about writing down something like this and using it. Um, interestingly, though, it didn't work that well on these kind of, even these simple games that we talked about. And we think that the issue is that these policy gradient losses are really not very good at finding ways to encode and use memories. Um, so I'll show you a bit more about that uh, soon. Um, this, is, this is in some sense the, like, I guess the intuition if you like. <clears throat> so uh, imagine I have a sort of a fairly long time horizon that I've been acting through. And back here in time, I took some images, some, some observation, and I encoded it, and then I stuck it into my memory, into my memory system. 
Um, and then later on in time, much sort of a fair bit further down in time, <coughs> I, I then sort of said, okay, I looked at my environment and I queried my memory based on what I'm currently seeing. And on the, base of that, on the basis of that memory query and maybe some other computation, I then take an action on the environment. <coughs> now, the policy gradient algorithm that I talked about effectively is going to sort of look at, look within this temporal credit assignment window. You sort of can compute a policy gradient and get updates which would tell you how best to act. Um, but importantly, you can kind of see here, it has nothing much of it all to say about these things that happened far ago in time, right? So that, that, that these, these, these temporal credit assignment windows are really important. Um, and, and so really back here where you, would, you sort of were encoding things, yeah, the policy gradient had nothing to say about it. Um, and this is, this is a, I think, an important problem. So one of the things that we've um, thought about doing, um, which, is, which is, I think, pretty natural, but it needs a little bit of fleshing out, is to say, well, let's have an unsupervised loss back here, which has nothing to do with task reward, right? So it's, it's basically, it's not, about, uh, it's not about getting points in the current game. Um, it's about, in our particular case, making unsupervised predictions about what will happen right next, in the near future. Um, so this, this task reward is local in time. Um, and something like this actually does work reasonably well. I'll show you. Uh, it needs a little more than just unsupervised prediction of the normal observations. Um, okay, so what do we do? This looks like a mess, but it's for people who care. Um, the important thing is basically this. Um, what, what, we, what we did um, was we said, okay, let's predict uh, the next sort of step in your observations that you see as you move through the environment. Um, but let's also predict the returns that you will expect to get. And this turns out to be crucial, this prediction of returns. And it actually is an idea, um, predicting the returns along, along with the standard observations um, is important in these experiments. And it happens to be an idea um, that goes back to some neuroscience by, work by Gluck and Myers. So they talked about this idea that um, if you really want uh, to form um, good, good encodings of things, you don't want to just do, say, auto encoding, uh, some sort of auto encoding loss. You actually want to predict uh, the re rewards or returns from your embeddings of, of, of um, observation information. Um, and so this was work, I think, uh, is quite, quite, quite a while ago now. Um, and, and when you do that, actually, this, these sorts of things work reasonably well. So this looks a bit scary, um, but I'll sort of point out the key features. This is the actual architecture that we, we ran and played with uh, recently. And it is a little more, as I said, uh, in some sense, cognitively inspired. So we have the normal policy stuff, which I showed you on this side. And this whole thing is a memory-based predictor. So as before, you get observations in. Um, what you do instead here, though, is that from your memory, you're computing a prior. Um, you're going to compute a prior, which tries to predict what you're going to see next coming in, from the observa uh, coming in from your observations. So think about moving around in a building uh, that you've uh, just been in for the first time, like this one, right, for me. Um, so you're moving around in this environment, and you're trying to predict what you're going to see next. Um, but importantly, you're doing it with memory. So if you've been there recently, and you have, you have memory of those things that you've seen recently, um, then it's easier to form a good prior about what I'm going to see next. So you're revisiting some place you've already been. You then correct that prior uh, using, using your, the information that comes in, that actually comes in, and from that you produce a latent code which basically says, this is, this is the kind of what I think the, the actual state I'm in. And so in this case what we have is uh, ultimately we end up with a reconstruction loss um, and we end up predicting the return for the RL tasks we're interested in. And that, as I said, will end up being crucial. So it's not about just predicting your observations. It's also about predicting the return that you would see uh, for your reinforcement loss. You, in practice, to do this kind of density estimation, we use an approximation to the, uh, the, the density, the log density that I showed in the last one. And so then uh, you end up with a KL, a KL cost between your posterior and prior here. Um, OK, so what happens in practice when, when we run these things, we see actually a pretty, a pretty uh, a kind of a world of difference between the basic policy gradient uh, loss on the architectures that I talked about. So those are in blue and uh, pink down here. Um, and this, this thing that we call Merlin, just for memory, RL, and inference, um, it's the, the yellow curve here. Um, and that's playing this memory game. 
Um, and in particular, you can see actually when it gets to this step, uh, it's already seen this, uh, it's previously seen this object. And it, when it finds this one, when it stumbles across it, it makes a memory read back to this location. So the little red square is notating where it, which, which previous observation it makes a memory read to. And because it can read back to that observation, then it can flip over that card next and uh, get the point. And so it, it really makes a world of difference in this kind of toy task. Um, and I guess what I'll show you now are some, I think, cooler non-toy tasks. Okay, so this is in some sense, I think, what really inspired us and got us uh, thinking about these kinds of problems. Um, and I should say, the problem I'm going to explain is really something that SLAM, this sort of simultaneous localization and mapping, could do really well. And these are hand, they're sort of good hand-engineered approaches to these kinds of problems. The interesting thing about these kinds of algorithms is you might solve a problem like this, but also you sort of remain generic and be able to do other things. So the problem works like this. It's a goal-finding task. You find, an agent finds itself on a new, a new map that it's never been on. It's a procedurally generated one when we actually run these experiments. And somewhere on the map is a goal. And you've got to navigate to the goal. You've got to explore until you find the goal. And then once you find the goal, you're going to respawn somewhere randomly on this map. <clears throat> and you should, you should go and find that goal again as quickly as you can. And you're going to do this for a fixed amount of time. And the number of points that you get is related to the number of times you find the goal. So what you should do is use your memory of the map, remember where the goal is, remember, remember where landmarks are, and, and go and reacquire this thing as quickly as you can from wherever you end up. So this is, this is the basic task. And the story uh, that I told you before is much the same. So these, uh, these, other, uh, these other architectures trained with just the policy gradient loss um, learn to explore. So they do a decent job of moving around, bumbling around until, until they see the goal. And then once they see it, they can go toward it and find it, no problem. <clears throat> they, don't, uh, they won't take off like this, um, in, in this in this case. They won't go and say, okay, I remember where this thing is. There's a landmark in the distance. I should head towards that. And eventually, if I take another corner, I'll find the goal. Um, that's what they don't do a good job of. So here's a, a, a sort of a video of some of this in, in action. There's a bit of text narration as it goes. Um, hopefully it's going to work. The other one did, so... Um, yep. Okay. Is this going to work? Sorry about this. Can someone give me a time check, too? Um, okay, so this is exploration phase. Uh, it's sort of moving through the map. Um, and then you'll see uh, the value, the return prediction up on the left-hand side is basically flat. So it basically doesn't know. But there it saw the goal, and it saw the goal and knew, okay, I'm going to get it. Now, in subsequent parts, you'll see that the value function up there starts ramping up long before it gets the goal, which basically means it knows ah, I'm getting closer. Uh, I know I'm going to find the goal soon, so I'll, uh, I'm predicting that I'm going to get this reward soon. And that's really based on looking into its memory, thinking about where the goal is and where it is with respect to the goal on the map. We can also do some um, neat things where we look at then where memory reads are happening on points on the map um, as you go. I think what I'll do is I'll show you that, um, I'll show you that in, in, a, in a figure in a moment. Um, this is sort of the, old, the, the real important analysis in some sense, which is, uh, you can look at a time-to-goal analysis, which you might do in a water maze setting in neuroscience. And if you look at these, these architectures, they're basically flat, which is to say they always get to the goal in about the same amount of time. Um, this one, uh, this guy, who's got this unsupervised objective on, on its memory, is, is, is getting better as it goes through time. So as it spends more time on the map, puts more of that map into its memory, um, it can acquire the goal faster. Um, so... You also see some interesting phenomena like this, um, which is sort of a network's learning to, to sort of realize what the important features on the map are, which, the goal, which, which is the goal. And that comes from the return cost uh, coefficient that I talked about. So this, the return cost, which is to say, okay, um, which is to say uh, how important is it to predict the return versus predicting the set of uh, other set of observations. Um, as well, I suppose, uh, interestingly, this thing will start to predict the return it's going to get 
long ahead of uh, sort of getting the goal. So I should have showed you that in a, in a single simulation, but this is sort of thousands of trials averaged, and you can see it's predicting the return well ahead of these other guys. So the return prediction error is, is much lower. Okay. Um, the, the, I'm going to skip ahead a bit. I, I think I, I lost some time or something. The interesting thing, uh, I, as I said, about this versus something like SLAM, which we use in engineering, people use in engineering a fair bit, is it doesn't just do navigation. Um, it won't just do navigation and so on. We can do something like an, a, a, an object valuation task where you have to have memory for objects that you've previously encountered and, and they had values attached to them. So you can remember, you can put into your memory, you know, I've encountered this thing previously, it was worth this much to me. Now when I encounter another one, I can go and search into my memory, find out what it was worth and then act appropriately uh, on, this, on this basis. So this also works, this also works, uh, this also works well. And that's in some sense the point is to have fairly generic learning algorithms that will not only do something, do navigation, but also something like this task. Um, here we're doing a little bit of a memory analysis where we look at how long, where, where it sort of looks into its memory. Um, and, and so when you're looking at a particular object, uh, whether you look into your memory for related objects, so objects are the, that are of the same type. Okay. Um, I want to come back briefly in the last little bit to the credit assignment problem. I'm going to kind of leave that aside. As I said, um, all of the stuff that I've talked about, talked about, the reinforcement learning algorithms and the unsupervised stuff, all sort of fundamentally hinge on using backprop. Um, and and they, they, they do that because you've got this big, these big networks which need to communicate with each other, and you need to figure out how to apportion credit through those complicated systems. Um, and backprop is effectively the best way that we know of, uh, of doing that. And so I think that uh, it's very likely that Cortex has something similar. Um, not precisely the same, but something similar. It's worth mentioning for a moment why people consider backprop to be biologically Im implausible. Um, and basically it just comes down to this. If we take a, a, a network with a couple hidden layers and we compute the chain rule, we end up with this expression which kind of boils down why people think that bio, uh, backprop is biologically implausible. And that is that you've, uh, you've got a couple of things here that people don't like. You've got an error term. You've got, uh, you've got to use the transpose of the downstream weight matrices. Um, and those are probably the two big ones. You also need to compute the derivative of your local sigmoid function, but maybe this isn't so crazy. And then finally, you also need to do sort of separate forward and backward passes. But I think that there's a story coming and emerging from both sides, both from a machine learning perspective and also from a neuroscience perspective, um, which is saying, actually, I, uh, you know, backprop is very likely, or something like it is very likely going on in the brain. One of the things that has held us back, I think, is that our models of neurons in the past looked a bit like this. So that is, you know, the feed forward and the feedback connections into a neuron and cortex. People would conceive of it like this. And if you conceive of it like this, backprop looks crazy. Because it basically is like, well, here's this neuron. I'm getting voltage dumped into me both by the feed forward and feedback. And how do I tell where that voltage came from, where that voltage dump came from? Um, and, and that makes the idea of running separate forward and backward passes or anything like it look kind of crazy. Nowadays, we're starting to think of neurons a bit more like this, uh, which is that, say, the, the forward and backward connections really can come on to different parts of a neuron, which are electrotonically segregated. So <clears throat> you can have a basal compartment, which is quite electrotonically segregated from some apical compartment, say, of a pyramidal cell in cortex. And the communication between these uh, compartments is uh, sort of sparse um, and can be controlled even by populations of interneurons. And so with some of this machinery in place, actually some of the ideas about how to approximate backprop start to look at least not so crazy. Um, and we've indeed spent some time thinking about how you could create sort of more plausible deep learning algorithms. Um, so that is actually setting up, uh, setting up uh, models with multiple compartments in the neurons um, and trying to drive learning in them um, in, in, in ways that still functions. And this is the important thing. Like, you, you really need to end up with something that still actually produces reasonable results. Um, and I think we're, we're sort of taping, taking steps in that direction, but we're probably a ways off. I think I only have two minutes to wrap up now. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'm going to kind of leave it there. 
I'm pretty hopeful, actually, that we'll, with, with, with some back, talk back and forth um, between neuroscientists and machine learning, that we'll soon have, I think, some delineation of uh, a class of algorithms which kind of line up with the basic constraints that we're aware of from biology, such as no weight transport, um, somehow having to synchronize or sort out forward and backward passes, um, but that actually still function and produce good results on hard problems. Right, so um, what now? Um, I think we should maintain some healthy skepticism about the extent to which deep models are gonna explain human or animal uh, behavior, or cog behavior and cognition. But I also, I also just wanna get excited about exploring this new model space um, as a way of getting an intuition about you know, what might be going on. Um, and I think if you take it at that point, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it should be safe and, uh, and fun. And I think we're good. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Great. Okay. So the question is, uh, just to repeat it, some in some of the in some of the figures I'm showing here, there is uh, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of steps. And you know, what are we going to do if we ever want to get something that works in the real world? Uh, that's a great question, um, and I have a couple responses. So I, I focused on um, this sort of idea of having a model and using memory, and I would say that within these episodes, uh, so is, I'm going to kind of say a couple things here, but within these episodes, there is a form of learning that's going on in the sense of dumping stuff into memory and then quickly sort of sorting out um, what's there in my memory. So there is, I would say, almost a map-to-map -map kind of learning that's going on. So even though you spend maybe tens of millions, hundreds of millions of steps, you end up with an agent which is very flexible and is able to sort of look through its memory, put things together, and then act nicely on the basis of it. Even new information, in some sense. So I think that's part of the answer. Um, I think that there's another part of the answer which I didn't talk about so much, um, but which is uh, off-policy learning. And, and recently people, so I basically talked about only on policy learning stuff here, which is essentially, you kind of, you use a bit of information, and then you make a wait update, and then you throw it away. You throw that information away. People have, uh, recently, there's, a, there's a, a, a sort of a plethora of off policy learning algorithms, which basically, which are, make much, much better use of your data. So you basically put it into some memory buffer, and then you really cycle over that memory buffer and learn, and, and sort of learn everything you can off of that memory. Um, so I think that those two things together are a big part of the answer. The third part of the answer is, I think we have to consider the fact that, you know, when you look at animals behaving in the world, there's been essentially, there have been hundreds of millions of steps that have gone into that um, and, and, and in, in the evolutionary sense. So, you, you know, we've arrived at some architecture, some system, and some learning rules, which perform very well, but there was a whole lot of, uh, if you like, there was a whole lot of steps that went into getting to that point. Right, so I, I think that's part of the answer. W you know, what we do then for real world, real world stuff, um, it may be hard in some sense. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, what about catastrophic forgetting? Have we solved that? Uh, I mean, there's a elastic weight consolidation. <clears throat> yeah. So the question is, I guess everyone heard that. Uh, what about catastrophic forgetting, which is basically, you know, you've learned on one task, uh, and then you go and learn on another and you just forget about the last task that you did. Um, and I think um, the simple answer is we definitely haven't solved that uh, in any sort of real deep way. Um, I think that there are, um, there are hints to, some, to sort of the solution of some of those things in memory-like architectures. So you can imagine that actually if you have a memory which lets you sort of pull in information quickly and use it for a task, um, but do that without making too many changes to your sort of slower changing parameters, then you may not, you know, you, you don't have to damage those slower changing parameters and what they're doing. Um, but I think ultimately there's a whole lot of questions there. I mean, I think probably sparsity in the brain uh, makes a big difference um, in the sense that you have, you know, sparse sets of neurons that participate in this task versus that task. Uh, there's a whole lot more work to do there. I, I, I yeah, simple answer. So we're gonna have, uh, <clears throat> Sure. And Tim, you can have a seat there too. Okay. So 
Um, I'd like to thank our panel discussants. We have Ruslan Salakudinov, who is an associate professor in the machine learning department. He's also um, the head of uh, artificial intelligence at uh, the director of artificial intelligence research at Apple, yeah. and well, Mike Tarr, who is the department head in uh, uh, the psychology department here at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so th thanks uh, for agreeing to sort of be part of this discussion. Um, and I, I, I have a few questions, and then, like I said, we'll open this up a little bit more broadly. Um, but I, I wanted to uh, start off by asking you, where are we going to hit a wall in terms of what we can currently do with the models that we have? So things are pretty good. They're getting better. Um, maybe the biological stuff is a nice inspiration, but we don't need it. And I, I'd like to hear from you what what are the hurdles that we'd like to come that maybe biological information can give us insight into? So. Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. Okay, I, I guess maybe I can spell out a little more, a little more where I have hope, I, where I still have hope that the biology can be helpful and where it probably isn't. So I think it, in, on sort of high level architectural ideas, and uh, I think maybe it can be helpful there, like really high level, like in the sense of maybe you should have something like a hippocampus. Maybe you should be doing something like uh, something like this sort of predictive, um, uh, these sort of predictive losses, and so on. Um, I think at the low level, uh, we're already uh, sort of in, in you know sort of precise network design. We're already in a place where probably the engineer, like just doing science and engineering in just a pure machine learning realm, will do better. Um, and so I think it's really only at the high, the high cognitive level, maybe behavioral level as well, where animals and humans, you know, studying animals and humans is still useful. For example, you can sort of look and say, here's an animal that can do this in this many trials. Um, there's an existence proof. So you know, okay, well, there's got to be a way to do it. And that can sometimes be helpful. So in the existence proof sense, some of the sort of high level architecture of the brain sense, I'm a bit helpful, low level, I think we're already, yeah, moving past. Yeah. <clears throat> I guess I'll disagree a little. Okay. Um, so you're sort of saying, well, the high level, there's just some very obvious, you know, architectural things. But I think we can talk about the systems level of the brain. And there's a lot of fine-grained information about we have the constraints on those systems and the way they interact and the way they build things. And we don't only have to take the example of deep networks themselves, which are completely inspired by the ventral cortex of the primate visual system. And both Jan and Jeff looked at that and said, that's how we're going to design a deep network. <clears throat> And then they, you know, they put back prop in there, but essentially they were building that hierarchical network based on that. And I think there's a lot more sort of task-specific architectural constraints that we know about the brain in which we can apply them if we're thinking about more general kinds of learning systems and intelligent systems that we can, that we can bring in. And I'm not so sure even at the finer grain level that we don't have a lot more to learn because, yes, there's certain ways that networks outperform things, but that's partially because they run on a particular kind of hardware. And so then, yeah, they run better on that hardware, but if we think about new kinds of hardware that may be possible, and in fact that we may have to rethink the kind of hardware we have because of the way neurons actually do computation, and those may average, there may be good reasons to leverage that ultimately if we want to improve systems. We can get a lot of inspiration there. On the converse of that, I'd just say that the big problem we have is that, um, I always like to say these days that neuroscience data sucks because, not because intrinsically it sucks, but our measurement techniques are either um, too crude in terms of the resolution or in terms of their power, in terms of the number of observations. So we're always stuck by the fact that I'd like as a neuroscientist to tell a computational person, well, this is how a particular system works, but I never feel like we really have enough data to nail down most of the systems at the level I'd like to be able to do that. So maybe just um, one, one point for me, I'm a machine learning guy, I'm not really uh, a neuroscientist, but what I would love to sort of learn perhaps from neuroscience is, is um, you know, a lot of algorithms today, if we look at like reinforcement learning algorithms, deep, deep learning algorithms, you know, basically like you've shown examples where it requires, you know, hundreds of millions of experiences to learn something. Um, generally in deep learning, you know, you need tons of data. And, uh, you know, people are very good at learning from pure examples or from pure experiences, making, perhaps using inductive <coughs> biases. Um, and this is something that's, you know, in terms of architecture design, is it, is it just one big gigantic neural network that can solve everything? Probably not. Um, so I really like the work on the memory part because that's really, uh, I think it's actually a big step forward because that's where you're designing an external structure that 
you can learn what to store, you can learn what to read from. I think that's, that's very exciting, but as far as I know, getting these models to work is extremely hard. Like even with you know, what, what you've shown, and I mean, we're working on something similar and typically would require tons of compute, and, and so it seems like the architectures that we have right now, or the algorithms that we have right now, in particular in the enforcement learning domain, basically yeah. are kind of almost like we're basically doing random search. Uh, so it's what comes down to that. So it, and then people, I mean, <coughs> presumably, you know, our brains are way better at doing it, and somehow, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's, I mean, there's a lot, I, I think, so, I mean, I, th I should say, so there's a couple of things. I think there's been, and maybe the reference of random search, there's a, there was a paper and a blog post recently by uh, Ben Recht, I think, uh, is that right? Yeah. Um, and, and I think, I do think that there's some, big issues with that presentation of things. So I should say, these kinds of behaviors, through these kinds of beha uh, environments with images and all this kind of stuff, those kinds of random search uh, approaches really won't work. So they really fall entirely flat. Um, and you really do need something like backprop, like a pretty good variance, low variance estimator for your gradients to get those things to work at all. Um, which is not to say that I don't disagree with all the other things you said. So we're, we're, I think we're miles off of getting uh, the data efficiency down on a lot of these things. But I guess this is kind of back to my, my, my earlier point. Um, we're, in a funny, we're in a funny place, right? Because evolution had hundreds of millions of trials, at least in tr hundreds of millions of, of, of steps in the environment, if you like, to get where you got, or to get these, these animals where they are. And so in some sense, actually, I don't think, I don't know if it's all that crazy to expect that you would need hundreds of millions of steps in an environment where you're essentially learning to learn, right? So doing meta-learning, learning to put things into a memory, um, learning to read from it, learning to put, merge those memories down into better representations, um, and, and, and finally then maybe sort of updating your slower weights. Um, so, so if I could just ask a question here, um, in terms of learning to learn, so yeah. you know, biological systems are set up so that they have the <clears throat> infrastructure to do that, yeah. right? Without thousands of trials, they're biochemically organized so that they don't need those thousands or millions of trials. Right. So, I mean, why, you could do that to your architectures as well. Right, and, but the point is that to get to the point where an animal is set up to learn to learn, you, we, we, it had sort of hundreds of millions of steps in the evolution, uh, in, of evolution, if you like. So there was, there were really. So maybe we can just know those, and you could just, you know, plug them in. <laughs> well, well, then we just need the neuroscientists to well, tell that, them. That, well, that's yeah. called psychology. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's actually that's like, because I mean, if you think about the endeavor of psychology, is to learn a set of constraints that actually allow people to, for instance, learn language or learn right. visual problems or whatever it is. And I think that's actually so disagreeing a little with both of you here. First of all, I think it's the whole idea that people learn from very small numbers of examples is a little overblown, partially because of Tim's comment that. There is this whole evolutionary set of constraints, and part of the goal is rather than trying to learn them from scratch, we should look if we're um, interested in deep networks and how they learn, and what kinds of what are the minimal constraints we can impose, sometimes inspired by people or by animals, that allow us to learn much more efficiently. And we see a lot of that now in the kind of transfer learning that's going on in deep networks, where we can see that networks have been trained transfer actually quite efficiently under a number of small number of examples for tasks that people didn't think would transfer well. But, but the other reason I think that the whole learning from small number of examples, things is a little oversold, is if you watch, you said you have a newborn, if you watch how long it takes a child to actually bootstrap simple things like being able to walk or to be able to do lots of other tasks that we consider to be intelligent tasks, there really is an awful lot of data coming in over that whole period. Now, yes, they're active learners and there's a lot of constraint on there, but I still think sometimes it's easy to say things happen effortlessly in humans that really aren't at all effortless. I guess, I guess what I mean, maybe, maybe I should correct myself, maybe it's, it's when I, uh, there's a sort of combination of unsupervised learning and maybe you know, combined with reinforcement learning and supervised learning. And so right now, my feeling is that we're pretty good at supervised learning, right. but we're terrible at unsupervised learning, and we're also somewhat terrible with reinforcement learning. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, all of these signals that are coming in and, and, and you know, so uh, I still, you know, I, I believe, I mean, when, when I think about, you know, few short learning, I really mean to the extent that even in the supervised learning domain, like transfer learning is a good example. 
you know, can we build the systems that use lots and lots of data, label data, whatever that data might be, but when I go and learn a new task, or when I learn to generalize, when the first time I'm seeing a new object, I can quickly make inferences about this object. I can quickly, you know, uh, learn about it, and it doesn't require me to collect a lot of data about this new particular object or this new particular class mm -hmm. or this new particular behavior. I can, you know, I can adapt very quickly. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure we're there yet with with our existing algorithms. To some extent, maybe, but well, I think we're definitely not there yet. I actually think that some of that. So you're talking about, like, say, transfer learning in a supervised case. I actually think that some of the uh, some of the answer there is actually going to come down to um, uh, RL-like things. So that I think that part of the reason that humans are so good at, transfer, at transferring to new situations is that they actually interact in, this wor in, in, in the world in a way where they seek out adversarial they're examples. They're active learners. That's right. Yeah. And so they'll, they'll sort of say, like, look, I'm uncertain how the system will act over there, and they'll actually seek out some of those examples, yeah, which are in some sense adversarial, and, and, then, and then that lets you build, my, I think, much more robust representations. When you're in a supervised learning set setup and you basically are like, well, here's your training set and here's your transfer set, you, you, don't, get to, like, you, don't, you don't get to go and seek out uh, examples that would robustify your representations. And, and I think that is genuinely part of the answer. So I think actually the hope to do it in a purely supervised way may be actually a bit naive. I, I, I'm not naive, but like, yeah. So, so just along those lines, I, I think children are particularly good at, at finding those edges of, of what won't work and, and making mistakes, right? That's like their whole mode of operandi. Um, I, I want to I wanna come back to Ruslan's point, though. You said what we're bad at, particularly bad at, is reinforcement learning. And the question that I have for you all is, we talked a little bit about how what we know about the brain or about neurons might be able to inform how we model, we can build these learning models. But let's go the other direction. What would AI researchers like to know about how the brain works in order to make their models better, right? Well, so. of course, okay, so this is back to my comment about I think I'm a little more, in some ways I'm, I'm, I, I totally agree with you that, you know, Machine learning researchers have taken a bunch of inf inspiration from neuroscience in the past, like deep networks, like convolutional networks. Um, I think even things like NTMs were hippocampally inspired and so on. Um, I think that we may run out of that list soon, in the sense that there's, there's, there, there's, an amount, there's some amount to mine there. Um, and then I think the problem is uh, uh, that the data is not great. It, there's simple answers here. Look, I would just like to know what is the learning algorithm that the cortex runs? And if, we, if I just knew that, if we, if we could write that down, we could just go run it, and obviously that would be wonderful. And, and so just to be clear, <coughs> when you say what is the learning algorithm, what would the answer to that look like? Do you want to know that at an activity level, or at a connection level, or a regional Equation. level? What would yeah, your answer some look equations like? That talk about, <laughs> equations that talk about how to uh, make synaptic updates, yeah. uh, given, given you know, the, the, the neurons that feed it. Um, and I think if we had that, look, we would take, I think, evidently, like an enormous step, machine learning-wise. Um, but I think th this is where my pessimism kicks in, which is that we, we are, we, I think, are miles off uh, in neuroscience having an answer to say that question. And, and so I think what's happening, what's happening, I think, quite quickly, is that the, the sort of, we, we've learned things, uh, certainly from neuroscience, um, at the, at the, maybe even at the low level previously, but now I think we're moving into some weird regime where, for, for, to take an example, so convnets were a big step, right? They were, they were fantastic, um, but now actually the things that, say, work really well in machine learning um, are, if you take a problem like Go or even ImageNet, the things that work really well are things like ResNets, which look quite weird, actually, as far as when you, when you think about the brain. So they're, they're things that still have a bit of convolutional structure to them, but they're actually, they're quite strange, um, but they work much, much better at things like playing Go or, or ImageNet. And those were, those were built on in engineering principles now, um, about analyzing how learning dynamics could and should work, rather than going and hunting for further low-level implementation details. So, so I think you're saying we, we don't need any more inspiration, let's, let's engineer some things that look crazy. Oh, oh, Ruslan, what would you say to that? Or, or Mike? The, the, uh, I would just say, though, that I think you're talking about <laughs> from a general learning point of view. Sure. But if you take, take task-specific problems, let's say taking like, the object recognition problem, 
or something, something like that. There may be a lot more that we can use because we know a lot about the connectivity of the visual system. We know a lot about different processing stages. So there's a lot more constraint that can be drawn upon for each of these very specific mm -hmm. problems. So yes, if you're talking about the learning algorithm for Cortex, it may be really hard to write down for a long time. But there, I think there's still a lot of architectural and computational things that we do know about particularly perceptual systems, maybe less so about cognitive systems or even memory systems that can be brought in to help. And there's evidence actually that they do actually improve these networks in interesting ways. Sure. I mean, some things like uh, the way that you encode um, space or, or, or things like this, like grid, grid cell representations and so on, may, may well turn out to be uh, interesting for agents that want to navigate or something. So yeah, maybe there is st still some things to mine on that front. I guess what I mean is, I think that, that there may be a, there's maybe a sunset on that uh, reasonably soon. Well, they've ignored almost all of it till now, so there's an awful lot still to pay attention to. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Ruslan, 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 you have anything yeah. to add? Oh, no, 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 I just, yeah. I just, I just, I just want to say, I mean, it's true that residual networks are, are doing really well, but, but they're still sort of convolutional models. They really you know, are. They're kind of like, sure. They just have these additional kind of like, I agree, bizarre kind of connections, yeah. but the inspiration there was really just from gradient propagation. And sure. Maybe, I, maybe we just don't have the right optimization algorithms, you sure. know, so that we have to like engineer these additional pieces so that... But you know what's funny too though, if you look at the brain, one of the things we don't understand well is that we have all these white matter fiber tracks or these longer range connections and boy, if the resonant doesn't look a little bit like a bunch of fiber trap maps, we don't understand yet the relationship, but for all we know, that's exactly, there could be an interesting computational correspondence there about why oh, they no, exist. And, but so I'm not going to disagree that there aren't still those like potential interesting correspondences. It's more that I'm saying that we're just, we're, we're, the engineering is outrunning our sure. knowledge of the brain. No, so maybe so it's catching, but it may be outrunning, but it may be catching up to what the brain is actually like. Possibly. <laughs> um, so I, I have a question for you about setting reward. So. Um, you could argue that when we learn something, our reward, you know, has been generated by our experience or by some value that's been imposed upon us. But um, you could also argue that there are things that are sort of hardwired to be re rewarding. And I wondered if you could speak for a little bit about how we understand reward in training and then reinforcing outcomes. Because something <coughs> has to set that reward. Sure. And we could discuss how it's set in, in humans or in animals, but it, it absolutely has to be set in a synthetic network. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, so the rewards in synthetic cases are just sort of imposed. And I think one of the, I think one of the coolest mysteries, I mean, so here, here is something which, if neuroscience had something really concrete to say about it, I think would be fantastic. I'm not sure if it does. But here's something that I think is, is a real mystery right now in, in, in machine learning, which is, Okay, so you have some base set of rewards. I think as we do with humans, there's things which, you know, you, you want food, you want uh, maybe human touch, a few things like this, and they're clear that there's some, there's some bedrock of rewards. And then, um, I guess to, give, to take the example that I often go back to, we have these bizarre things where I love playing Go. I mean, I, I was like a Go player and I played probably too much of it in undergrad. And it's absolutely bizarre. It has nothing to do with like, like fecundity, uh, evolution had nothing to say about it. Why do I enjoy doing such a, like, uh, basically a pathological, it's almost like a pathological thing to get into a board game, right? Um, and so this, this sort of, this sort of where we're, the, the way that humans are able to sort of like manufacture, in some sense, rewards for themselves, and then really get into those, um, but simultaneously not be totally pathological, right? And get into the, the sort of like, you know, get into, the, the get into go to the point that I won't eat or sleep most of the time. Um, that is a cool, I, I think, and deep mystery that we really don't have a good, a good hold on or good sense of. Um, yeah. How do, you, how do you have a bedrock of rewards? How do you, but f from that bedrock, sort of like uh, produce these other sort of rewards for yourself, but that don't uh, run away and take over your whole life? There are people who, like, I mean, in J I think there was a couple cases of it, people, like, dying playing World of Warcraft, right? Because they wouldn't, like, they literally wouldn't leave to eat or sleep. But these are very rare, and they're but probably, like, narrow pathological cases. Yeah. yeah. How about you guys? Do you think that we, we are uh, anywhere close to a regime where you don't need to program in the reward? Well, it's actually been something, a couple recent workshops that we were talking about the idea that if we really want to get more general AI, 
we need the idea of, you, of motivation and of value and emotion as intrinsic yeah. to intelligent systems. And um, the interesting thing is that some people are really disturb that it might just be, for instance, there could be things like just a state of the system that could be change your reward function at a given time, but that may be what an emotion is. We don't really, you know, people keep wanting an equation for emotion or a model, but it might just be a state change of the whole system. And there is also, so relating to the idea of what base reward is, we've done some work where a student who worked with me found that every object in the world seems to have an intrinsic and fairly consistent value function to it. So trivial things like teacups. People prefer certain teacups over other teacups, and there's a lot of consistency within a culture about which teacups they prefer, and we can actually show it drives their behavior and their preferences unconsciously all the time. And it's true for everything, and maybe that's an intrinsic part of the system, partially because otherwise we could never make decisions. There's lots of things that would otherwise be equivalent from a reward point of view, and so we'd be frozen. And there's this great story by Damasio about a patient of his that he never really did good clinical analysis on, but this doctor that had um, a lesion to, um, to part of their frontal lobes that actually seemed to lose this part of the system. And they said that they'd be frozen, they couldn't write the prescription anymore, even though they were perfectly good at practicing um, medicine, because they couldn't decide which pen to pick. And so they would sit there staring at the pen, and he describes that, and he was frozen by that. But normally we just pick one, and it becomes, and that's the one we like. Yeah. And so there may be a level which the system has just decided to throw reward onto everything, and it doesn't really matter that much for a lot of things, whether it's positive or negative, as long as there's some differential reward among everything we have out there. And so it could be kind of arbitrary, but that could be fine. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I mean I can add much to that. I know. I mean, we are trying to look at. It's a very interesting question. There is a, a whole, I guess, subfield called inverse reinforcement learning, which is basically trying to figure out what is the reward structure that you know experts are using. And you know, so we've looked at games like one of my students is looking at games like Minecraft, and just recording behaviors of different people. And it's bizarre because it's apparently there are no rewards. Just people do whatever they want to do, and. You know, we're trying to do inverse reinforcement learning to figure out are there are certain rewards that people are chasing, and it's it turns out that you know some people just like to break stuff and they just go around and break stuff, and then some people like to build stuff and they just go and build stuff. There is no particular reward that you get by playing the game; you just do it inside the game. And so, you know, uh, maybe ultimately there is some distribution over possible rewards, and you know, you get a sample from distribution, you assign to one particular expert, and that's what ex this expert is doing. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a very good question, you know, how we design, do we design our own rewards? Do we, you know, what, what I guess it kind of comes to the value, what, what's our own values? And you know, maybe that diversity of reward, right? Some people like to break, some people like to build, right? Is actually would optimize outcomes if you distribute those different value structures. Yep. I, I want to take a minute here to open this up to our audience. Um, if there's any uh, questions that you'd like to address to the panel, we have time for just a couple questions. Yeah, so I should. I, yeah, so I should say I so, don't. So should we repeat the question just just <coughs> briefly? So um, the question is: uh, uh, convolutional networks are really different from neurons. They don't have you know synaptic weights or membrane potentials or I mean inhibition, for example. If you have more realistic models, would you have back back propagation? And you know the contention is maybe it's too expensive. Um, I see. Like, if you had, I guess, I just to clarify, this is if you had more realistic models on a computer, would you still want to do backprop? Is that the question? No, I'm saying. Or in, 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 in the brain, given, given neural computing hardware. Yeah. Well, the, the, sure. The, but the answer, I think the answer in both cases, so I should say, first of all, I, I should make clear, 
I don't think that I or really anyone takes seriously the idea that backprop is running liter uh, literally in the brain. And then in, in, in uh, networks, say on a computer, if you built them and had more complex neurons, um, just because you do that, that does not mean that you wouldn't want to do effectively backprop or some approximation of it. You might approximate it. I agree with you there. Um, I mean, people are now starting to play with spiking networks um, in simulation and actually train them to do interesting things, which is not easy or simple because when you have a spike, effectively you have a non-differentiable uh, event which has happened. And, but I'll tell you what, what people do now, which is most successful. Uh, they basically kind of smooth that out in a way in various, with various approaches, and then they just do back propagation. Um, so that's exactly what people do actually when they run spiking networks now and actually get, want to get them to do interesting stuff. Now I still think that there's some really interesting hard problems there in the sense of <clears throat> how, do you get, uh, how do you get a working good algorithm that will solve hard problems in multi-layer networks of spiking units without doing these tricks of smoothing stuff out and taking derivatives through everything. And I think that's like, I mean look, that's an open and, and difficult question. Mike, Russ, do you have anything to add? I think that, you know, that's, that's uh, uh, like Tim is saying, yeah, um, what works right now in practice is backprop, right? I mean, it shouldn't be as a surprise because you have some signal, you compute the derivatives, and you're just doing gradient-based optimization. So it's very hard to kind of beat that, uh, right, because it's just basic rules of calculus. I, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of work, there's been a lot of work in the past on Hebian learning, if you look at Boltzmann machines and Hopefield networks, and is a little bit more inspired from, you know, from, from, from neuroscience. And these models have local learning rules, right? And they're a little bit more plausible, but at the same time, they're also lacking, you know, at least at this day and age, they're lacking from, you know, performance-based. Uh, and it <laughs> it's, has to do with the fact that maybe there are better architectures or better algorithms, you know, it's, uh, but that's, that's where we are right now. Maybe in the future that will change because I do believe that local learning rules has certain advantages, right? Because you, you're building this gigantic model. Somehow the feeling is that you have the signal here and you have to backpropagate the whole thing up and down. It seems like, you know, a lot of effort. Um, yeah. But if you're sort of like <coughs> changing things locally and you're propagating local changes, it seems a little bit more plausible. But we haven't figured out good ways of, of, of you know, I, I want to just add one thing briefly about like the heavy and stuff, which I think you're right. I mean, people it summons for people this notion of sort of biological plausibility. But as you said, they re it, like just doing sort of heavy and like things really does not work in practice um, for hard problems. Um, but I think that there's another way to view these things, which is when you go and pull up the backprop rule, there's there's really actually I mean I, I there's a way of rewriting that where it basically is a three-term thing, which looks like effectively a presynaptic uh, activity, um, some simple function of your postsynaptic activity, and then a third term, which is from feedback, right? So there's, there's, you, you can actually rewrite that rule where it looks pretty much Hebbian with a third term that regulates, uh, regulates the, the sign of things. And, and so it's not that far off from doing uh, something close to backprop. Now, where you get that, uh, where you would get that signal, and how you would compute it, there's hard questions around that. But look, we have tons of feedback in cortex, um, and in some sense, you have to ask yourself, you know, what the hell is it doing if it's not providing uh, learning uh, learning information to earlier layers? Uh, how about one last question? Yeah. Uh, actually, I have two questions. I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, so, first question is. Um, how much do we actually know about the brain's computational power? Because Professor, uh, Professor Tenenbaum said uh, we, we don't actually know if one neuron is like a ReLU unit which is dumb or like a CPU core. Uh, <laughs> and then the second <coughs> question is um, how are we expecting to sort of gain this symbolic sort of learning uh, abilities? Like, for example, for one shot and zero shot learning, if we have this sort of like symbolic representations, we can sort of like reason about it in a higher level and then deduce things that we've never seen before. Uh, so is it just through you know, a ton of data or is it expecting that we have a ton of data and then suddenly we have this kind of efficient representation or are we gonna build some bias into the networks? Thank you. Great question. Um, I think Russ probably has a bunch of things to say about this, but I, I'll start off by saying, yep. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I think everybody heard him, yeah. We had a mic, good. Um, 
The, I, I think that, you, you, that, that's a hard, that is a really hard one. How do you have, I mean, I think most, most animals are great at like sub-symbolic processing. They're good at pattern recognition, all these things. And, and humans have gotten good at somehow kind of traversing those worlds of sort of, sort of symbolic things and, and sub-symbolic things. I mean, I should say humans are still pretty bad at it, right? We're terrible at math. We're absolutely awful at it. Um, and that's, you know, it's, we really weren't built to do it. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I think, I think it's, it is a hard question. Most of the networks we've built so far are good at the sub-symbolic sub stuff. They're good pattern processors. And how you get them to then also be able to do these symbolic reasoning kinds of things is tough. My intuition is back to the comment I, I made to Russ earlier, which is that if you just try and do this in a sort of supervised way, I think you'll end up with brittle representations where you, when you sort of test those on, on out of distribution uh, questions, um, they'll kind of fall apart. I think you really do need to actually interact with an environment um, <clears throat> and, and, and uh, interact with an environment and choose kind of adversarial examples that tweak your representations in the right direction where they actually become robust and kind of symbolic-ish. Um, but, but we'll see. Yeah. I guess your first question is in neuron. Oh yeah, I forgot yeah, on the first question. I, I focused on the one I like. That's probably Mike. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, okay. no one can answer that, right? I mean, we keep learning more about the granularity of computation in the brain at the neuron level and then the level what network connectivity is doing too. So I think it's, it's like, you know, it's turtles all the way down. Um, um, but it, it's powerful, obviously, and estimating it's kind of an exercise in futility. But I mean, I, just as an anecdote about that, I have a friend that's an expert in um, retinal processing, and I was talking to him about sort of state of the art on um, what we know about ganglion cell types at this point. And I forget, up, they were up to maybe, is it like 47 different ganglion cell types in the primate retina at this point that are doing computationally distinct things? You know, it's some crazy number. And they, keep, and they don't even know what all of them do. They've just sort of cataloged the different types that are there. And so there's a lot we really don't understand the fine grain level about computation. So it's very, very, very powerful. Um, the second part about the zero shot learning and symbolic, I mean, the funny thing is, of course, that's the old Carnegie Mellon tradition. Simon and Newell and now John Anderson and people like that. And I think that everyone agrees that there's a role for that. And that how we get from the kind of learning that's become popular in AI that that kind of representation is not completely clear. And it's clear also that those kinds of systems do certain kinds of tasks very well that the sort of modern AI doesn't necessarily do well. So hybrid architectures are probably going to ultimately be necessary. And it's like, you know, we do have a frontal lobe, um, which seems to be one of the major areas for symbolic computation. But again, whether that's emergent out of pure learning experience and some kind of combination of supervised and unsupervised, or there's, again, we have constraint. So it could be that it's the iterative power of hundreds of millions of um, <coughs> generations of our ancestors allowed symbolic computation to emerge, but not that you could ever induce it just from pure experience or something. We, we don't really know. Yeah, that, that would be an example of where, I mean, if we had some constraints from psychology or neuroscience, I would be very excited. But it's not clear to me that we do. No, not, not entirely, although we, we have some notion of what the kinds of things symbolic computation is really good for. And some ideas algorithmically, I mean, you can go to things like Kahneman and Fersky and other people like that to think about the kinds of reasoning problems that really, you know, often are really amenable to that kind of structure. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think there is also a little bit of work more recently that sort of tries to combine symbolic representation with, with, with deep learning. And sort of deep learning is really good at, you know, processing high dimensional sensory input, you know, like high dimensional images, videos. <coughs> Uh, and such, right? And then how can you get the representation that you can do reasoning? That's kind of another big step that a lot of people are working on right now. Like in particular, in language understanding, there's some work that tries to combine deep learning perhaps with some logical rules, uh, right? And so a hybrid system that can, you know, either it's data-driven or, or if certain rules or certain, you know, uh, um, prior knowledge that you, you, that you can incorporate, and if that helps you to solve your particular task, then, then you know, there are ways of, of combining both of them, right? So the jury is still out. I mean, obviously, in machine learning land, we in machine learning uh, want to be purists, right? We want to just learn everything from data, and, and, and that's generally the approach that you see in our community, in deep learning in particular. But for some tasks, you know, 
hybrid systems would probably be the answer. Uh, like there's a lot of work on knowledge bases, right? Yeah. Like, like having something about the price, about the world, and how things operate and such. And, and bringing can, models into um, deep networks is something that's really, I think, important. I mean, yeah. so for instance, even in things like you think of perceptual tests, like capturing human motion, like Deva Ramanan's been doing work where you know he's got essentially a kinematic model of the human body in there, and that makes a big difference in how you learn Absolutely. things. And there's no reason to think that we don't incorporate that kind of thing as a constraint de novo when we try and do learning. And so there's probably a lot of that going on. Yep. I'd like to, <clears throat> I'd like to thank our panelists. And before we conclude here, we have a gift for you, Tim. So uh, this is a sort of from yeah, Victor Baird himself. Sure. So I'd like to present you with this beautiful <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. So I want to just thank Ruslan and Mike and Tim for giving us a great discussion, and thank you all for spending your Friday afternoon with us.